Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. He'd done it again. For the third time in just five minutes, he'd wandered off the track. So far, in fact, that he couldn't even remember where he had been. Pulling himself upright and adjusting the bed sheets around him, he thought it ridiculous that he had such a problem. It was absolutely inexcusable. At no time in his life had prayer come easy. And so now with, with eyes clenched tight, he grieved. Hard to believe. I've been a Christian for 10 years and still I have to force myself to pray. Those are the opening words of... Uh, Richard Pratt's excellent book entitled, Pray With Your Eyes Open. And they're words that I'm sure many of us can relate to and be associated with. For to be honest, how many of us here this morning have not experienced the frustration that we experience in our prayer lives. Oh, we know that, that, that prayer is a, a, a wonderful grace and, and gift that, that God has given to us. But we also know that it's a source of, of frustration and grief and guilt. And I would hazard to suggest this morning that we all fail at this discipline more than we fail in any other area of our Christian walk and life and witness. Because prayer is not simple. Prayer is not just, just putting together the, the, the right words. Prayer is not just some mechanical exercise. It's not just the application of some liturgy. Prayer is demanding. Prayer is relational. And therefore at times we, we have great struggle with it. And, and we allow our, our, our feelings in any given moment to dictate what we pray to determine when we pray. We pray far too often simply when we feel like it. And we don't often feel like it. And yet I think God in His gracious providence has created two elements, two environments that do cause us and move us to pray, and to pray honestly, and to pray earnestly. And the first is this, that when we are confronted with the problem, with the difficulty, with an obstacle that is beyond our own capabilities, Surely it's then that we really pray. Surely it's when some great problem confronts us that we can't handle ourselves and that's pressing down upon us. It's then when we do pray with an urgency and we pray with, with, with a cry in our hearts. How long, O oh Lord, how long? So that God in His providence 
causes us to pray during times of affliction. Because it's during such times that we find that we do pray more readily. And we do pray more easily. And we do pray with all of our hearts. God uses affliction to cause us to pray. The second element that I believe God uses in his providence is when we consider the people that we love. Mums and dads, let me ask you a question this morning, and grandmas and grandpas. Why is it that we can find that we pray more consistently and more faithfully for our children and our grandchildren more than we do for anyone else? It's much easier to pray for our children, isn't it? Much easier to pray for our grandchildren. Why is this the case? Is it not because of the affection that we have for them? The love leads us to pray for them. So that the Lord not only brings affliction into our lives to make us to pray, but he creates affection in our hearts for others that also enables us to pray. And so it was for the Apostle Paul. Last Sunday we began looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians. And you have your Bible, New Testament with you this morning. Return with me please to this this portion of God's word. Paul's letter, Paul's loveliest letter, his epistle to the church at Philippi. Last week we began by introducing some of what we found in verses 1 and 2. This morning we want to, to move on to see something of Paul's praying. For in verses 3 through 8, we see something of Paul's prayer life. And then from verses 9 to 11 of this first chapter, you see something of Paul's prayer list. And it's within this portion of the epistle that we, we see something of Paul's affection His love for all the people in this congregation so that he remembers them with thankfulness and with joy in prayer. I'm reading Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Here is is Paul praying with energy, praying with joy, praying with affection. He's not frustrated. He's not being exhausted. There's nothing dull about this, this duty. But here he is, with loving remembrance and a heart full of joy, pouring out his heart to God. And so here in this third verse, I direct your attention to a thankful memory. And then in verse 4, we see a joyful spirituality. And then in verse 5, a helpful fraternity. That's our outline for this morning. It begins at verse 3, a thankful memory. I thank my God in all of my remembrance of you. 
So let me ask, when was the last time you thanked God for another person? Well, let me frame it this way. Who in this church do you thank God for in your prayers? What memories do you have of people in this congregation, in this church, that you give thanks to God for? And what memories of people in this church fills your heart with joy? Because this is what Paul has experienced. This is what Paul is expressing. This is what he's expounding and testifying to here. But you see, Paul was a man who practiced what he preached. Some years earlier, he had written his epistle to the church of Thessalonica. And in that epistle, he says this, and I quote from 1 Thessalonians 5.18. He says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So if you're here this morning wanting to know what the will of God is for your life, here it is. It is to learn to give thanks in every circumstance. And then at a similar time of of writing his letter to the Philippians, he wrote his letter to the Ephesians. What did he say to them? Well, turn back just a few pages in your New Testament. I'm going to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4. Here he writes, Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Let there be thanksgiving. The same time as he was writing Philippians and writing Ephesians, he also wrote Colossians. So if you turn onward now to the letter to the Colossians, just the next book after Philippians, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, we read these words. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So he's exhorting people to do what he does himself. And so what what triggers this, this thanksgiving that he writes of in this third verse of Philippians chapter 1. Why is he thankful? Well, as you work your way through the opening verses of this first chapter, you will see that, that, that he implicates, he implies, he brings out some of the things that cause him to be joyful and thankful to God for these Philippians. From verses 3 to 5, he thanks God for their fellowship in the gospel. In verse 6, he thanks God for their faithfulness in the gospel. He says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. In verse 7, he is is thankful for their fearlessness in the gospel. He said, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the fence and confirmation of the gospel. And then in verse 8, he thanks God for their friendship, in the gospel. Notice his words, verse 8, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. It's his remembrance of them that triggers off his thanksgiving. It's his memory of them that causes him to rejoice and to be glad. 
Paul, we might say, was, was thinking, thinking back. Thinking of that first visit that he had at Philippi. And Paul is thanking God for a jailer who almost took his life, but instead who found eternal life. He was thinking and thanking God for a woman who had been possessed by a, a demon but now was, was wonderfully liberated because even as we were singing earlier, when the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Paul was thinking and thanking God for that businesswoman whose heart God had opened, Lydia, and who then had opened her home for the servants of the gospel. Paul had memories. Blessed memories, a remembrance that resulted in thanksgiving to God. He remembered, and so he rejoiced. But not only remembrance, another trigger to his thanksgiving was the relationship which he enjoyed with the people here at Philippi. For how, how did Paul regard these Philippians? Well, look with me. I'm in the first chapter of Philippians. The beginning of verse 7, what does he say? It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. Look at verse 8. What does he say here? For God is my witness, how I yearn, how I long for you all, with the affection, with the love of Christ. If you go over to chapter 2 and verse 12, what does he say here? Therefore, my beloved. What an affectionate term. What a warm and embracing term. My beloved. Beloved, what does he say in chapter 4 and verse 1? Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. What was the relationship? How does he regard them? What terms does he employ to describe this relationship? Oh, you are my, my joy and my crown. I long for you. I love you. You are my beloved. And it was because Paul loved these people as he did that he found it easy to pray for them as he did. Because this, this strong affection that he had for them stimulated his praying. And the truth applies to us as well. For this strong affection that stimulates prayer should be found in the heart of all of God's people. Enabling us, moving us to pray for one another. Why should it be easy for us to pray for one another here? Why should it be easy for us to remember with joy one another? Because of the affection of Christ Jesus. For you see, my friends, what, what, is, what is the mark of a true Christian. And what is the mark of a true church? Now, the, the more you'll get to know me, the more you'll realize I'm a bit of a heretic. And, and, and I don't always see eye to eye with, with, with the great sense of, of the past. And this, this is one of those areas where I, I, I disagree a bit with my older Reformed friends and even, even maybe some of the Puritans. Some of you who, who, who know of that history and theology will understand that, that the three major marks of the Christian church are regarded as true preaching of the Word of God, the true demonstration or application of the sacraments, and true discipline within the church. 
Very good. Sorry, I disagree. To me, the great mark of the church and the great mark of a Christian is love. Love will flow through those other means of grace that we mention. But what did Paul say was the greatest thing? He says the greatest thing is love. And you read the epistles. What was Paul always looking for? He was looking for evidence of hope. He was looking for evidence of faith. He was looking for evidence of love in the church. 1 Corinthians 13, you know, we, 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 we take out those early verses, don't we? Those verses that talk about love, and we cut them out, and we paste them up, and we read them, we read them out of the marriage service. You want to know what God's love looks like? It looks like what's written there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And Paul says you can have marvelous faith. He says you can give yourself as a martyr to die for the cause of Christ. But he says if you don't have love, you're nothing. You're a zero. There's nothing. What badge did Jesus Christ leave with his followers whereby they could show they belonged to Jesus? He only left one badge. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world outside this church has the right to see our love for one another. That is the distinguishing feature of God's people. And it's that love in our hearts, it's that affection for one another that enables us to pray for one another with passion and with regularity and with honesty and with earnestness and with ease. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And E.M. Bounds, who's written much on prayer, simply put it this way. Our spirit towards folks is the life of prayer. What's he saying? How we relate to one another affects how we relate in our prayer life with God. Paul had a thankful memory that arose out of remembrance and relationship. And then he goes on in verse 4, and I'm describing that as a joyful spirituality, because he says, always, in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Now, as you, as you read the life of Paul, you soon become aware of the challenges that he had to face and of the struggles he had to endure, and the sorrows he had to feel, and the disappointments that he had to experience. In fact, this, this note of suffering formed part of the apostle's calling. What do I mean by that? Come back in your Bible to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Here is this portion of God's Word that deals with the calling, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul the Apostle. Acts chapter 9, I'm going to read from verse 10. Read along with me here. Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus called Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a, named, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. 
But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard for many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And now notice verse 16. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Paul was called to believe and to suffer, even as he writes to the Philippians here at the end of chapter 1. Yet Paul's spirituality was anything but morbid and mournful. His spirituality was, was infectious. It was exuberant. It was, in one word, joyful. And that's what this epistle really is all about. As we said last week, this, this epistle to the Philippians is regarded as Paul's loveliest letter. It is his most joyous letter. He, he speaks of joy and rejoicing some 16 times in these four chapters. And here once again we see Paul's example as he models his message. Because remember, where was Paul when he was writing this letter? He was in prison. He is a man in prison, yet he is able to speak and to testify about joy. Paul is a man marked by gratitude and gladness and thanksgiving and joy, so that in no way was he conditioned or controlled by his circumstances. And this is the picture we see in this epistle. Because don't miss the little words that come in this fourth verse. Let me underline them or highlight them for you. Notice verse 4 again. Always, in every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy. A continuous, comprehensive chorus of joy comes from the Apostle's heart for these people. And you see, here, here is the transforming power of the gospel. Here is what the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is what it can do in the life, and this is what it can do in the life of a church. For notice not only Paul's example, but I draw your attention to his exhortation. Let me simply walk you through this book, thinking about the joy that's here. You see, in chapter 1, as I said, Paul is in prison. But he talks here about praying, praying with joy. The saints have been concerned about him. There were those who were trying to gain some benefit of him being incarcerated. They were trying to add to his troubles. So how does the apostle respond to this fact of his location and that others were trying to gain because of his hardship? Well, look with me at chapter 1 and verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word with fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. What was their motive? 
They were preaching Christ. They were preaching, but they were trying to do it in such a manner as to bring greater troubles and trials to Paul. And says, doesn't matter. Christ is being preached. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice. Paul triumphs over his circumstances. He refuses to allow his circumstances to dictate either his agenda or his attitude. He gets his mindset from the Lord, not from circumstances. You go into chapter 2. You read of the elements of discord within the church. There's selfishness in this church. There's, there's, there's self-centeredness in this church. So what's his message to the church here? Well, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. And so having given that exhortation, then he gives an example. And what's the example he gives in chapter 2? He gives us that wonderful Christological picture of Christ Jesus humbling himself and going to the cross and dying on the cross and then rising again. The question is, what was it that motivates Christ going to the cross? What was upon his heart? What was his affection? What was his emotion as he goes to the cross? The writer of the Hebrew tells us, does he not? For the joy that was set before him, he goes to the cross. He's motivated by joy. And this is what Paul is bringing out here. This whole element of, of joy that motivated our Lord. And so Paul says in chapter 2 and verse 2, complete my joy be being of the same mind. You go on into the third chapter. And in the third chapter, Paul deals with the issues that may rob us of our joy. And what is it that can seek to steal the joy out of our hearts? Paul makes it very clear that it's false teaching. It's false teaching. And the need to maintain a right relationship with the Lord. And so Paul completes the third chapter and begins the fourth chapter with these words, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. And so you come into the last chapter, and Paul models how we can maintain our joyfulness in spite of adverse circumstances by exhorting the people here to rejoice in the Lord always. And just in case you didn't get it, let me repeat it again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Joy is woven right through this whole book. That Paul was a man who knew true spirituality was marked and indicated by joy. And as I have pointed out, this was not due to living a quiet life, free from adverse circumstances or challenging conditions, because Paul lived a rather rugged life. If you want to read about some of Paul's difficulties and trials, read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Because there at the end he talks about how he was, if I can put it in this way, how Paul became a basket case for Christ Jesus. I think most of us understand what means to be a basket case, a nut case. He's talked about how he was let down from a wall in a basket to escape some difficulties. Here was Paul willing to be a basket case for Christ Jesus, to be nothing, to be regarded almost as being insane, and yet he did it with joy. And so I ask you this morning, what's stealing your joy? Why are we such a miserable witness to the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul was bold. He was full of joy. But don't misunderstand me. Christian joy is not some sort of happy, clappy, mindless escape from reality. 
Christian joy is not some stoical spirit of negative resignation, you know, K sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. You know, I come from the UK, and, 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 and Christian joy is not having a, a stiff upper lip, the way the British might claim. It's real. It confronts difficulties. It knows difficulties. It knows pain. It knows anguish. But in the midst of all that, joy is a depth of well-being of soul and relationship with God. The apostle made his prayer for all the Philippians with joy. With joy. And he gives us one of the reasons for that in verse 5, where he speaks of a helpful fraternity. A helpful fraternity. What does he say here? Because. He's just said he's been praying with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. The partnership in the gospel. Why is Paul moved with joy and filled with joy here? Well, basically because of three things. Let me give them to you and I'm done for the morning. The first is this. Paul was filled with joy because of the Philippians' continued commitment to the spread of the gospel. He speaks of this partnership of the gospel from the first day until now. That what what began at that riverside in Philippi and recorded in Acts 16, 13, had burst its banks and the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had flooded, as it were, that fertile plain in central Macedonia. The gospel had now come to Europe. This is what caused him joy that these people were still proclaiming the message which they had known personally and powerfully. Paul writes of them as as those who still maintain the faith of the gospel. He exhorts them to continue to stand fast in the gospel. The constancy of the Philippian commitment to the spread of the gospel supplied the ground for Paul's joy. The second thing was this. His joy was motivated by the fact that Philippians continued commitment to the servants of the gospel. That as they had cared for the early apostles, as Liddy had opened her heart, as the Philippian jailer had opened his home, as they'd ministered to these dear saints, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke and so forth, that that ministry, particularly that Paul, had continued. I'm not going to take the time to, 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 to work through it. But read. Read what happened from Paul's second missionary journey at Philippi to his third missionary journey and see how this church had loved him and cared for him. And that gave him joy. The Philippians' commitment to Paul moved him so much that he regarded them as we've already seen, his joy and crown. And so remembrance of their gospel witness, remembrance of their continued commitment to him filled him with joy. And thirdly, Paul continued to rejoice in the Philippians because of their continued commitment to the support of the gospel. The support of the gospel. He's going to deal with this in chapter 4 from verse 10. And it's within that section that you read of him again speaking of the word that you find here in this fifth verse. It's an interesting word. It's that word, partnership. Partnership. What, what, does, what does he mean there? Well, it's a word that many of you will know well, koinonia. It's a word for fellowship. Probably the most misused word in the Christian church. We talk about fellowship. I'm going to, I'm going to invite you to stay after the service in just a few moments because you can have some fellowship together with tea and coffee and bonox or whatever else you might like to drink. 
You can stop and have a little conversation. No, we call that fellowship. We get together and we have, let's get together and have some fellowship. But what does the word really mean? What does it imply? Because it does imply more than just a cuppa and a conversation. In the first century, and here I'm quoting from D.A. Carson, the word commonly had commercial overtones. And he illustrates. If John and Harry buy a boat and start a fishing business, they have entered into a fellowship. They have entered into a partnership. So the heart of true fellowship is self-sacrificing conformity to a shared vision. Let me give that to you again. The heart of true fellowship is self-sacrificing conformity to a shared vision. John and Henry have shared the vision which will cause them to make a company to produce a fishing fleet. And so, from the moment of their conversion, these Philippian Christians rolled up their sleeves and got self-sacrificially involved in the ministry of furthering the gospel. Self-sacrificially giving themselves to the spread of the gospel, to sustaining the servants of the gospel, and to supporting the work of the gospel. And so it was that praying for these Philippian Christians for Paul was, was easy. It was easy. Just to remember them brought rejoicing. Just to remember them brought joy. Just to remember them enabled him to freely pray for all of them. And so let me turn this on its head by asking, do we find praying for this church a joy? Isn't it a joy? To come is our fellowship motivating us, our partnership together motivating us with joy to pray? Does every remembrance of it lead us to praise and thanksgiving? And then let me ask this Are there people in this congregation thanking God for you? Are we a source of thanksgiving to others? Do we make it easy for others to pray for us? Are we manifesting our affection for them? That they find it easy to pray for us? Because you see, the lesson we surely need to learn here is that affection is what brings life to our praying. That affection and love is what liberates our praying. That affection and love is the lubricant for our praying. Because without love, praying is hard labor. And so Paul picks up and develops this theme of love and prayer in the next section, as we will see. And he further reveals another element that helps us to pray with joy and with thanksgiving. But you see, it all comes back to that crazy little thing called love. Love. So how dwelleth the love of Christ in us? You can answer that by looking at your praying, by looking at your praying. So let's do that right now. Let's pray together.